Okay. So the chapter nine um, case study was in analyzing the Usenet data set. And I didn't, I haven't heard of Usenet mm -hmm. before now, but it's kind of cool. Um, it's uh, this data set came from Usenet, which was a way kind of like a bulletin board before the internet uh, that was kind of started like in the early 80s up until like the late 90s um, where people just like posted uh, like certain within certain categories, like certain topics, like there would be a topic on sports, a topic on science, a, to a topic on politics, for example. And then like there'll be sub almost like Reddit, like sub threads. Um, and then I think Google like picked it up and like it became like Google forums, uh, Google groups or something like this. I don't know. Anyways, so pretty interesting. Um, so the objectives of this chapter is to kind of understand the Usenet data um, by pre-processing it, understand how to apply T TF and topic TF-IDF and topic modeling to that data, and then understand how to apply sentiment analysis and n-gram analysis to the Usenet data. Um, but in the interest of time, and also because I believe some of the, um, the methods are redundant, um, I kind of just focused on some key pieces and left out others. Um, so the Usenet data is, was pretty messy. So the pre-processing actually is the bulk of this, um, <laughs> was the bulk of this chapter, um, just because there was a lot of noisy characters. Um, and this data set contained, um, what was it? It was somewhere along the lines of, se yeah, seven over 700,000 um, records. Um, so they created a little function to go through, if you, if you actually go to the link in the chapter and download the folder, it's a zipped folder in it. There is a training set. So this data is actually used for modeling. So there's a, te a test set and a training set. And, um, but we're only using the training set in this example. Uh, there's a function created that goes through the directory and gets um, the, the full directory name and then reads the lines out of each subfolder like uh, into a data frame. Uh, and then takes, creates an ID variable that takes the base of that URL. So like, it'll be like this path. Um, and then the subfolder is going to be like the topic. So you have um, computers comp dot graphics. Um, um, so yeah, so we take that. So we take that function and apply it over each subfolder in our training directory. Um, which there are 20. So we create this table that has already a, a folder variable with the directory um, and then create a new variable called folder out where we map that folder into uh, this read folder function. And what that results, um, and then we unnest those columns because what that results um, and what this results in is a table of two columns in which there, the first column is the directory, like the full path of the full of the subfolder, and a list column of a list column of data frames. So you want to un, unnest those. So unnest flattens that column so that you can get all of those um, records in one data frame. Uh, um, let's see. And then we have a new a column called news group that is formed from the base name. Um, I didn't know this function before now, um, but it takes the very end of that path of that um, directory path uh, and creates this um, variable using that plus the ID and the text. Um, so you end up getting something like this. So news group takes, this is the subfolder. 
within this training folder, there is 20 subfolders. So this is the name of the subfolder, the ID um, and the text variable. Um, and then what I've noticed is that the news groups have a kind of hierarchy, which we will find useful in our later analyses. So kind of follow the structure of the main topic, followed by the subtopic. And then for some, some topics, there'll even be a sub subtopic. So you'll have like three levels. Okay, so now that we've read in the data, there are several things that we have to get rid of. So because this is like a bulletin board, it gets treated like a chat. So you see things like um, from colon, blah, 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 someone's like email address in brackets or an email signature or a lot of blank lines um, and a bunch of just random numbers. So we wanna filter out all of these with some regular expressions and just some filtering. Um, so we use the stringer package um, to get that raw text data and we want to group and we want to do the filtering within each news group and ID, filter out all of the um, uh, email signatures because the email signatures are going to be lo like locate an empty line and a, a line that has two dashes. So that's what this is right here. And then once we've filtered that out, um, then we can clean out things like um, responses to other uh, users. So usually, um, and I wouldn't have noticed this because it's like way down when you get the raw text, like it's all the way down. Um, you see things like text beginning in a, greater than sign that um, is actually a response to somebody else. So we wanna filter those out as they could be redundant. Um, any blank, blank text equals like a blank space. Um, any line that contains the term rights followed by a colon. So this is again, somebody responding to somebody else. Um, anything beginning with in article. So you, in regular expressions, you have like the carrot um, that's to start with in article. And this also removes any numbers as well. Um, so any like any string that begins with the open, um, sorry, the greater than sign followed by upper or lowercase, um, letters and digits. And then for some reason, two specifically noisy records that they chose to omit, that is just a bunch of garbage. Um, so that reduces our data set to 269,000 records. All right, so after all that pre-processing, um, we can finally tokenize our data set and we choose to do this by word. So we use our tidy text package. We take our clean text data, we unnest it and we tokenize it by words and we remove the stop words. Oh, before we remove the stop words, we have to remove all the numbers because this tokenized also all the digits. Um, so this removes any, um, sorry, this keeps only words. Um, yeah. And so we're left with 710,000 words. All right. So the next section goes into kind of discovering what words are in each news group. And we do that by um, TFIDF and topic modeling. So we wanna see which words are the most frequent and influential. So to do that, we first need to um, get the count of each word um, within each news group. So for each news group, which um, words 
um, and sort them, uh, the frequency of each word. Um, so we take that data set, words by news group, um, apply the bind TF IDF function um, onto word um, by news group with the value n and arrange it by the most, um, arrange the resulting data frame by the highest TF IDF score. And we see here that the news group comp dot sys dot ibm dot pc dot hardware and the word sc si i'm not sure what that means is has the highest tf ids um in the book they if you read the chapter if you go through the example they decided to continue with the rest of the examples um, going into the Psy news group, but I deviated a little bit because I wanted, I was more curious to see what like talk is about because to me, I felt like that was a little counterintuitive to the whole thing, <laughs> why there's a sub, like a subtopic called talk. Um, I, I guess I didn't really read the rules, but I just figured that it would fall in, like if you were going to talk, it would fall into some other category. Maybe talk is just about miscellaneous. Um, so I did that instead. So we want to visualize each board, uh, each of the boards in this particular topic. So I, like I said, I chose the talk um, topic. So I filtered that data frame by um, any uh, record that's where news group starts in talk. And then um, take the top 12 words um, based on the TFIDF and reordered it uh, so that the highest TFIDF is um, in descending order. And then you and, and then you facet by the news group. So you see that talk politics guns, um, the Middle East, there is a politics miscellaneous top um, board and a religion miscellaneous board. But you'll see later, it's kind of weird, the religion miscellaneous, because there's also a religion topic, but just for Christianity. But when you look at the words in the topic, in this topic, it's mostly kind of related to Christianity as well. So, hey, this is 1993, um, which also, I was really curious why um, Middle East came up with a lot of Armenians and Azerbaijan and Turkey. And I looked it up, apparently in 93, there was a, a little war where a bunch of like Azerbaijan, uh, like minorities were like kicked out um, from th their regions, like Armenians like attacked the Azerbaijan uh, group, Azerbaijani group, um, which resulted in a lot of uh, deaths. I think it was like, it was only, a, I think the battle was only lasted like a month or so, but like over 100,000 people died. I think it's like the 93 undefense. I can't remember. I just Googled 1993 Armenian at Azerbaijan, and that's the first thing that came up. So, that explains why people, a lot of people were talking about Armenia and Azerbaijan on this, on this board. Um, and then guns. Firearms were a very you know, popular topic on this board, which is cool. And Stephanopoulos. Go and, I wonder if it's the same Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos from the news from 93, um, but he's the only uh, miscellaneous popular guy or person or never. I, I really don't know if there's another Stephanopoulos size for Stephanopoulos. Wow, you know? that's, that's wild that that really sticks out so much. <laughs> yeah, um, go him. Um, so I continued on that pattern on the talk. I wanted to see what people are talking about outside of these topic groups. Um, 
So um, now that we've seen the most influential um, words in each topic group based on their TFIDF, we can see which are more which topics are correlated by do, calculating their pairwise correlation. So within the YDR package, there is the function pairwise core. So that kind of does that like uh, like I mentioned, I think I even did this in chapter four where you do the, um, what's it called? Um, it's now called spread and no, spread and gather are the old ones. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot get spread and gather out of my, wait, is this spread? And, no. Uh, it's it's pivot wider and pivot longer now. Pivot wider and pivot longer. I don't, I got, you know, it took me so long to get spread and gather that now I can't get spread and gather out of my head. Um, so yeah, so it pivots wider your data frame to calculate the matrix um, to do the pairwise correlations. Uh, to get the uh, matrix to pairwise correlation. So essentially you get the um, news group is your item to compare. So that ends up being like your item one and item two based on the feature, uh, which is the word itself. And then to do the, the correlation, you have the value N. That's gonna be your value. So like when you do a pivot, you need your feature and your value um, um, arguments. Um, so when we do our pairwise correlation, we can see all of that talk, religion, social religion, alt, atheism, like those have like the highest everything religion focused ha are the highest um, most most highly correlated, um, most highly correlated topics um, or news groups. Okay, so that kind of doesn't really, I mean, that wasn't really like a beautiful segue based on what we were just talking about, but it's a, it, it is what it is. We, they looked at um, science, topics, I looked at talk topics, but we can see that the most correlated topics are things related to religion. Um, all right, so now we can do the topic modeling. So in the, um, I think it was like chapter six or whatever, um, we did Leighton Dirichlet, Dirichlet, I can't say that, allocation, LDA. Um, to sort the messages from the different news groups. So the first thing that we have to do is create the document term matrix. Um, and to do the, to create the document term matrix, we're going to take our um, already tokenized Usenet words and filter on talk. So I'm only going to do again the subgroup or I'm not using that right the topic talk so any any news group that begins in talk um, group by each individual word and get the total count of the words um, and then I want to only keep in this particular data frame words that appear at least 50 times so I end up with a data frame of over 70,000 um, related uh, in the talk topic. So in order to convert that data frame into a document term matrix, um, we uh, create documents that follow the structure topic word n. So we take that data frame that we just created that has the counts of the um, the accounts of each of the words filtered out by ones uh, the most frequent, like above 50. And then we create this new variable called document where we unite news group and ID. And then we count 
for each document the word and use the cast DTM function to then create the matrix, the um, document term matrix, which returns a object of class large document matrix that is 1,896 by 662. So each document by word. Each, I don't think I said that right. Yeah, each of the documents, yeah, with the word, their words. Okay. Um, all right, so now that we have our Real document made, yeah. Just what was the difference between document and ID? Is ID for the person who posts? Um, oh, no. So, I mean, it could be. It's just a variable that like gives the particular post ID. Um, actually, let me look really quick. I actually might be wrong because I noticed that ID is used as a grouping variable a lot, which means it's probably not super unique. Yeah. Um, I'm just realizing that at some point I slipped up and now I'm, I don't know what the difference between document and ID is. Oh, well, in this particular case, the document is for the modeling itself. ID is a variable in the data set. I see. So I see. I, yeah, the ID is related to the post itself. It came from the Usenet data. Okay. So don't, yeah, don't conflate that. Document is a, is a variable that we are creating. Like we're, we're creating our documents in this sense, which contains like the, the words by the ID, like for by each post. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know if that makes sense. But it's, the documents are not are not um, part of the data set. It's we have to create the documents. Yeah, no, I get that now. I was just blanking on the argument structure of unite. I had to just look it up and yeah, so it's the first thing, the first argument is the column you're creating and then it's dot, 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 all the columns you're you're merging. So now, now I get it. I was just being yeah. dumb. No, no, no. It's fine. It's totally cool. Like I, I also, I have to be reminded of like all, all these things. Um, so yeah. Uh, where are we? All right. So now we have um, our matrix that is 1896 by 662. And we can call the topics uh, topic models library and merely apply the LDA function to that matrix, a document matrix, and we set our grouping variable by uh, set it to four. And then we set our seed um, for uh, consistency. Um, and then you can see the results. So we can visualize the results of the topic models to see if we get something similar to what we had before um in the tfidf frequency like the bar graphs um and if you look at the four topics they are kind of they're kind of the same so here you see a lot of uh mention of armenian turks israeli israel so this will be like our middle east topic this would be our politics topic. Um, this has guns and Jesus. So I'm not entirely sure of this one. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna say, uh, I'm not gonna say this is recorded. Um, so, I remember there was up here a like talk religion miscellaneous and a politics and guns. So maybe these two got a little mushed. Um, and then you had like a miscellaneous politics one, which, okay, I don't think this is the best topic modeling because you have Armenians and home and started, I, I guess, Topics three and four could almost be the same topic because it's like killed people. 
anyways. Yeah, maybe religious people kill and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, maybe I could have, the, the example in the book does a better job. Like, well, actually, even their example when they stuck to the science topics um, weren't exactly like on par. But, you know, if you didn't do that frequency, like the TFIDF first and went directly to topic modeling, you could almost kind of create these topics on your own. Um, finally, in the, in the book, they did do um, a visualization on gamma distribution based on um, the gamma values from the LDA. I skipped it for the sake, sake of um, time. Um, all right, and then the final thing is sentiment analysis. You know, we've been, we've done sentiment analysis a couple times now. Um, so they did sentiment analysis by words. They did sentiment analysis by, um, well, first like positive and negative, and then they went and did which words contributed the most within each news group. So they broke it down even further. And then like, what were the most positive and negative messages? So I skipped straight to like, sentiment analysis by message instead of doing it by words. Um, since we've already covered that, I think a couple of times throughout this book. So what um, we're gonna do here is try and figure out which messages in this entire Usenet data set have, are the most positive and which are the most negative. And so we take that tokenized data, Usenet data set and we use the AFIN. Now I wanted to use the, the data uh, set that Sh Sham, I think, mentioned before, but I forgot what it was um, for sentiment analysis. I couldn't remember. Do you remember what it was? Oh, yeah, um, from different package, right? Mm. Yeah, um, I forgot the package name. Yeah. You know, because okay. like the, the data set, um, the sentiment lexicon is no longer available freely. And the mm. other part of provide that um, it's not on top of my head at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't remember. I guess I, I probably could have watched the um, recording. Um, wait, but even then the text, you wrote it in the chat. So I have to find it. But anyways, the AFIN data set is available and that's what we use here. Um, and we group that data set by news group and ID. So ID is a grouping variable here in this particular data set. Um, it, it I think is associated with a, a post. And then we um, group by news group ID, summarize by the mean um, value uh, so we create sentiment by taking the mean of the value from AFIN and create uh, words, which is the, um, the, and the total number of the, the words. And then we uh, want to see just uh, the records, um, the messages where they have more than or equal to five words. Um, why do you mean the value? So value comes from AFIN. So you know how AFIN um, characterizes from like negative five to positive five? Okay. So, I think yeah. the, the question is though, so, so Sham, it's that the, the actual message, each individual message is distri distributed across multiple rows. Is that, is that the reason? Why? So that's why you have to like summarize. So like one message might take up five rows. So you want the mean. So no, um, what I mean, like here, what she's doing, I think what's doing here is like for each sentence, we are taking the mean of the uh, sentiment words when we added them, right? Correct? Uh, because like, oh, mm. so it's not like now what I expect is just to sum the sentiment value of words that have sentiment orientation in them and said this is the sentiment of that sentence. Uh, but here we are taking the mean 
of these values, correct? Yes. So my but question is, why, why do we take them in? Because we are, um, from what I understand, is um, because we're grouping, because we're looking at messages instead of individual words, we, um, we want to group by, we want the, the AFIN value for the entire message. So we take the, the value for each individual word and then take the mean of all those words to get the, the sentiment value for the entire message. Does that make sense? Um, so um, ideally, for example, if we want to find the sentiment value of a particular message, what we do here, the lexicon base, what we do is to sum the sentiment orientation value for each word right in the message. Is that correct? Yeah. When we sum them, the value it gives us um, that we said this is a sentiment for the whole message. Is that correct? Yes, I think. Um, yeah, right. So if, for example, we have two words, good, 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 something like that, very good and excellent, then we sum the sentiment value of good and also the sentiment value of excellent, right? Um, mm -hmm. Those words. Then we say this is the total sentiment of the sentence, correct? But what I'm saying here is like, um, we are taking the mean of the sum. I, I don't know if that's correct. Well, we would want to because the the way you assess the sentiment for this particular method is on a scale, right? It's scaled from negative five to five, and you want to make sure that they are in that they stay in that range. Otherwise, you could have some messages with uh, if we just take the sum, you'll have some messages that have a value of twenty five and some messages that have a value of two. Okay. And they could average out to be kind of similar if you take the mean in terms of overall yeah. sentiment mm -hmm. for the entire yeah. message. Okay. You know okay. Mean? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Got you. I guess like, if I had to explain this to someone, I would say that that sum doesn't take into account the length of the message, but mean does. So that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's, so it's exactly what Layla was saying is that you could have messages that, and then I'll just add by virtue of their length, end up having, and like maybe someone is like, it's a relatively neutral message, but they have an aversion to negative words. So they don't say any negative words. And just by writing like a, you know, a novel as a comment, they get like a sentiment score of 1,800, right? And it's not that it's extremely positive. It's just that it was really, really long. Um, but then if you took the mean, maybe you would have a sentiment score of like 0.5. Yeah. That's yeah. My yeah, interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So you can actually see that. So when we actually, uh, when you look at this, what's, what ends up being returned, you can see that the, these news groups um, have the highest sentiments. So like um, this particular ID, um, this, the recreation, sport, like the hockey topic, um, this particular message had 18 words in it and had a 3.89. So it was a pretty positive sentiment. Um, so we wanted to see, they wanted to see what is the most positive, which message was the most positive in this entire data set. Um, and that is message um, that was post 53560. So they have a um, created a little function that takes in the the um, the news group and the message ID and just cleans it up. So you filter um, the text by the clean text um, and pull out that particular message ID and uh, print it. So you can see that the most positive post in this entire data set has to do with hockey. And it just says, it says, everybody send me your predictions for Stanley Cup playoffs. 
the winner of the Buffalo Boston, winner of Montreal, Pittsburgh, winner of blah, blah, blah. And the reason why we are thinking that this has the most positive is because uh, it contains the word winner a lot. And winner is has a pretty positive sentiment. But really, as you can see, like, this person is just soliciting, like, information from the masses on who for Stanley Cup playoffs for uh, hockey. Um, it's not necessarily a very positive message. But what was the most negative message? So we did the reverse. And we can see that somebody wrote, um, they have, somebody accepted into Western Business School is not a dork just because they're out of a the country. It doesn't think blah, blah, blah. Anyways, North Stars are S-H-I-T, privileged, chicken, what, <laughs> losers, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So somebody is a little peeved. Um, so that was, doesn't have anything to do with hockey. I don't, like I have, I really don't know. Um, but that's what was, what was returned when I put in that particular ID. Okay, and then finally, I know I'm running, uh, I'm cutting into, um, time, but the last thing that was covered in this chapter was n-gram analysis, but I didn't go over it because that's covered, that was covered in chapter four, and really all that does is break out the, um, um, break out the messages by their, um, like create, and like different n-grams or bigrams and trigrams, and look at how uh, which words um, influence are, mo are more inf not influential? Sorry, what I'm trying to say is create the bigrams and the trigrams in order to do the negation um, influence. So, like, which words are actually positive, but they're followed by um, "don't" or "no" or "never." Like, "don't panic," for example, is not negative but it's it's interpreted as such computationally because it's preceded by the word don't and and like seeing which words are like influential in that way and I can show you um oops yeah so this was the end of that chapter where you can see that the most uh the, the largest source of misidentifying a word as positive come from the word don't. So don't want, don't like, don't care. And then the reverse being um, no problem. So that's also the most, I, the word problem is the most misidentified in this data set because it's preceded by no. Um, and that was the end of that chapter, oops. And Andrew is peeved. Right. Okay, Justin, you got this. I gotta go pick up my fur babies. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Lena. All right. Thanks, guys. I will see you all in. Well, I'll just keep in touch on the Slack and all right. figure okay. out um, during Smalter when we do Smalter. Are we are we officially gonna call it Smalter? Sounds like some Lord of the Lord of the Rings thing. <laughs> I don't know. It's too. I don't want to call it. What 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 it's actually called? Um, uh, uh, supervised uh, machine learning. Learning. Yeah. <laughs> it's so long. All right. We're All gonna right. call it. We're gonna call it Smalter. I guess. <laughs> if you have a better, if you have a better idea. I totally would go, go for a cooler name, but, you know, that's TBD. All right, TBD. All right. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Later. Hey, Justin. Okay. Hey. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so I guess I'll be brief. Yeah. Okay. Case. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be the the last meeting for a while. So. <laughs> yeah.
fun. Um, okay, so yeah, so like I said, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. I'll try to finish. Uh, well, I'll definitely finish by four. Okay. Um, um, all right, so no, I was looking at the 1993 summer offensive, often offensives. Uh, but okay, so like I said, I'll be brief. Um, so as, as I did before, I used a different data set to try to illustrate the same things as they do in the book. So in the book, they talk about NASA metadata. So NASA is one agency of the United States government. The NSF is a, another, is a different agency from the US government. The NSF, I really dropped the ball here. The NSF is an acronym for National Science Foundation. And they have a wealth of data online. So that's nice. Um, so I have the stuff here about like basically what it is. It was founded in 1950, that's not on here. So it's 71 years old now. Um, but basically it funds scientific research would be a way to, to, a way to put okay. it. Mm. And so okay. there's a lot of cleaning, data cleaning and gathering that went on behind the scenes. Uh, that's uh, I just didn't include that. So, um, but in my case, uh, this is this is maybe important. Uh, you can get the archives for NSF grants from all the way back into the 1950s. But just for fun, I decided to do 1999 uh, to see. And I <laughs> here I write just to see what was going on right before Y2K, which uh, as a person who was born in the 90s uh, was a moment I remember when people thought everything was gonna crash uh, as the year turned from 1999 to 2000. So that was a moment in time. In any case, uh, this data set, NSF 1999, has uh, 10,400 rows, which each row corresponds to a grant. Um, so I have the call names here. Again, this, some presenting of raw data would be nice, but I, uh, I guess I'm not nice. Uh, so each grant has an ID, it has a title, it has the date, um, it has the amount that was given, it has a directorate, which a directorate is like uh, within the NSF, depending on what type of science is being done, you can have, uh, you might apply to the engineering, for example, directorate, or if you're a biologist, you apply to the biological sciences directorate, or for example, I would apply to the social and behavioral sciences directorate. So there are different directorates that correspond to different disciplinary boundaries. And then there's an abstract for what the person, the researchers want to do. Um, so here I have just a, a table where I show that, you know, okay, so MPS, for example, is mathematical and physical sciences. So of the 10,400 grants, you know, a fifth of them about uh, were from mathematical and physical sciences, then uh, geology, then engineering, biology, um, that's education and human resources, I think maybe. Anyway, so, so that's just kind of the lay of the land for this data set. Um, so, okay, so I'm just gonna dive into this uh, since time is of the essence. Um, I'm not gonna go over the code to create unigrams um, because that's something that is an old hat by now, but I will notice that you inspecting uh, unigrams now I'm alone presenting to nobody, that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna to present to you, YouTube. Uh, oh, hey, Sean, you're back. Hey, good to see you again. Um, oh yeah, my internet was a bit weird, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I was just saying that um, I'm not gonna go over the code to look at unigrams, but it's always good to look at the most used words. And so you can see in, for example, in this data set, they have a BR token for like break between lines. Like just that's how their text was processed. So yeah. that's obviously gonna be a word that I want to get rid of. Um, and I was also looking at numbers as I've just gathered more experience oftentimes numbers. Uh, I mean, Layla mentioned this in her presentation as well, that it's useful to look at just how often numbers are present. So there are those. 
Um, so then I write here that obviously I'm gonna, I will get rid of BR. And for example, research and project are definitely gonna be stop words. Um, and so I have a sentence here, but I, I was going to embark on this project of trying to find stop words in a more efficient way. But uh, yeah. this, but um, I'll have to save that for later. So, so just through iteratively looking at uh, most used words in directorates, uh, this is like a very subjective. You created this one manually, right? I created that manually, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, and so, so then here I just did a very typical so I filtered such that a word has to at least contain a letter. So that was my way of just getting rid of purely numeric tokens. So it just has to contain a letter somewhere, uh, which you know maybe is a bad idea. For example, if you think that things like 1999 or 2000 are going to be indicative. So that's with that caveat. And then I did the familiar anti-join with uh, just inline creating a, a tibble of stop words from a vector of stop words that I had made up here. Um, okay, and so uh, just basic unigram analysis, um, you know, so we see, so these are the different directorates, and like, what are the most used words within each directorate? Uh, and thankfully, there are things that you would think, you know, for example, within the biology, you have species, protein, cell, protein, studies, genes, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, this is, oh yeah, huh. Okay, it's interesting that in education and human resources, engineering was uh, the most used words and engineering it's uh, down there. So it's, okay. you know, yeah. so, so there's some interesting things, you know, um, but uh, in, in, for example, uh, geology, you know, you have ocean ice processes, model high climate. So you have a lot of high climate modeling going on back, uh, more than 20 years ago. So yeah, so there's some interesting things. Bigram. Then Bigram. Um, yeah. So this was an interesting thing, I thought, where, um, so, so again, um, so here's, here, well, I'll, I'll do a couple things. First, um, it's, all, it's nice to see that these things make sense. Um, for example, here in education, community college was a, a yeah. big Bigram that received yeah. you know, a lot of funding. Yeah, um, for the biology, it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, so the bigrams, I think, are pretty interesting to, to like, let people, it's kind of a time capsule, so you can see what was going on in that field at that time. Uh, so I, I imagine that today, biology would look pretty different from what it was uh, 20 years ago. So, so that actually, over time, I think would be a, a very interesting thing to do as opposed to Within, within a given year. Um, a couple of things that I, I thought were interesting and that could be improved uh, is so notice how these actually have, most of these you could say uh, are, are relatively nice and have, so they're supposed to have um, N equals eight. So the most popular, sorry, the eight most used bigrams. Uh, and I think most of them, I think all of them. Oh yeah, so this one doesn't, but uh, so, so here, for example, in this directorate, there's a big problem. There are all these things, and it's because there are some there are ties. So that's an interesting behavior of slice max. Uh, it's good to know is that it will retain ties, um, which I, I think is the best behavior. But really, what you would want to do, I suppose, is arrange them and then do slice head, but. That's just a, a technical R note. But uh, another thing that, that occurred to me that is, is interesting is that if you think about what these X axes are, they're not really useful, I don't think. I, like I, I mean, what they are. Yeah, they are not useful, right? Right, is it, so what it is, if you stop to think about it, is the proportion of bigrams within the directory that are that bigram. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, and I'm not sure really what that, that quantity means. Like, I mean, I'm, I know what it means, but I'm not sure like how yeah. useful that is. Uh, I mean, the proportion, it appears, right? 
Um, yes. Yeah. In, even there, though, it's it's not exactly that because we got rid of the stop words earlier, so there would have been a lot oh, yeah. more bigrams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So, so, so I was thinking about that, and and so I noticed here that the n in this case uh, wasn't a good metric. But what I thought is more ideal is the number of grants in which that bigram appears. Um, and so I have like <laughs> my musings about this, I was thinking about it. And so what I ultimately did was I, I did the exact same thing earlier uh, for the exploratory phase, where I just was looking at how many grants there were per um, directorate. And that, but I saved it this time. I didn't arrange it, but I just wanted to print this for so that I could show what was going on. And so then what I did was I, um, basically what I did was I just calculated this. I said, so I wanted to see actually the number, the percent of grants within a directory in which that bigram appears. And so again, some ties made this uh, pretty ugly printout. Made this for made for a pretty ugly uh, printout. Um, okay, I but see. I thought that this cool. is a much more useful yeah, yeah. x-axis. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Agree with you. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but it, it does take more coding. I'm sure I would wager that there's a more efficient way to do this than what I did, but. Um, because basically what I had to do was I had to say when, you know, uh, the directory of a given row matches, you know, one of these. So let's like, for example, here when it matches one, one, when it is bio, then change in. So divide in basically by the corresponding uh, total number of grants. So, uh, and it had to be separate for each one. So again, not sure that that's optimal. I, I was I thought about you know doing it in uh, just like with counting and stuff, but uh, the solution did not occur to me. So, but I mean I did find a solution, just probably not the most elegant one. Um, yeah, that's good. I, I did do a TF IDF, so that was in the in the book as well. Um, for each for each of these, and. There's, there's one interesting thing about the, the TF-IDF with a really large data set and few categories that I, 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 should have, I should have pictured here, but there are a lot of words, thousands of words with TF-IDF scores of zero. And I guess just to get to the, to spoil, like the spoiler is that a TF-IDF will be zero for a word will be zero if that, a word, if that word appears for, in this case, in every directorate. So what that means, uh, so anyway, it's just, it's just a feature of, of the TF-IDF is that it has to be zero if, uh, uh, okay, actually that's, that's not true. There are different formulas for TF-IDF and that's, I guess, beyond the scope of the two minutes I have left. <laughs> but, uh, but at least the calculation that tiny text does will just give it zero. So that, that's sort of alluding back to something I said earlier where I was trying to, to figure out a way to get rid of stop words that was based on TF-IDF actually. Uh, and it didn't end up working because so many words had TF-IDF scores of zero because they had IDFs of zero. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's beyond this. Uh, so just really super briefly, because I don't think I do anything that unique here, uh, I just went back to the whole, um, no, I, sorry, I did the opposite. I subsetted to computer science 1999 uh, to make this a bit more tractable because this isn't a super fast algorithm. Um, so I just want to see like, okay, so I, I've looked at comparisons between different directorates. What about within one discipline? So I, I chose computer science because again, uh, this whole Y2K thing was a cultural moment of everyone fearing that their computer was going to break. Um, I'm not, I didn't find anything super interesting in the, the eight topics. Again, I just said eight, why not? Um, I'm sure someone who was 
more tuned into computers could like see, could read the, the tea leaves as they were. But a couple of things I thought were interesting um, that I'll go over just again in a minute since Layla didn't is the gamma. So, the, so this is the, the, the beta scores for words within topics. And then the gamma, so uh, the probability that a document is in a topic, uh, just for, you know, just looking at these, here we see topic one, this is what the actual data frame looks like. Um, you know, they're gonna range from zero to one because of probabilities. And indeed we see that there's some really high probabilities uh, and there's some like negligibly small probabilities. Um, and so here, this is just what the, I thought this is an interesting thing. So if you just take literally this, this column and make a histogram of that, uh, that's what you get. And uh, I'm not really sure what to make of that, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I think in some ways it makes sense because there are eight topics. So, um, and since the units of this, of the, the gamma matrix are document topics. That means that each document is divided up between eight rows. And so I, in my head, it makes sense that like the algorithm is going to say like definitely no to a few topics. And that's what causes this big mass here at basically zero. And I know it here, 76% of the, the gammas are less than 1%. So there's that. Uh, and then just to be super brief, um, I really like these colors a lot, um, but there are a couple of different ways to look at the distribution of topics. One is just group by the topic itself, get the mean of the gammas. And so that's what this does. So mean gamma across documents, so, uh, or across topics, maybe that should read. In any case, uh, so you see that topic two, we have 15, so like the mean gamma is 0.15 for that. I, I think a much more useful uh, statistic is to see um, how many documents were assigned to that topic. And what's interesting is that the relationship isn't completely the same. So whereas, for example, five had a higher mean gamma than six, six had more documents that would be assigned to it than five, for example. Um, okay, I see. Yeah, and you see that, but I mean, it was close. I mean, it was basically a tie between five and six. So it's not radical. That, and so for example, one and three as well, uh, there's a bigger difference here. So three has a higher mean gamma than one, but one has more documents assigned to it. So, and by, and by assigned to the topic, I just mean for each document, you take the max, it's just a basic classification algorithm. You just take the, the gamma. So you take the topic that corresponds to the highest gamma for that document. So that's that is. And then the very last thing I'll show since I'm over time is I thought this would be interesting uh, to figure out like how clean are the classifications? So what, this is showing is that over 40% of the documents had a rating that was 90% or higher, um, which I think is, is good. Um, 80% yeah. or sorry, sorry. Then I don't know what that would be 12, 12, 11 or 12% Probably 11 have, you know, 80 to 89 is what that should really be. And you can go down. And so you do see that there are, you know, uh, if you look at 50, well, I guess 40 to 49 or less, you know, between those, it's probably fewer than, it's definitely fewer than 10%. Um, but even these, you know, are, yeah, it's only 50% to 59% that it is a given topic. So I thought that was an interesting thing to do that. I don't recall ever seeing in the book, but I could have forgotten a visualization like this. Um, and then the last thing, which I'm not really going to go over, is I created a little pageable. Uh, so, so in, in the NASA data set, they didn't. They did have titles, but they also had keywords. These NSF grants don't have keywords, but I thought, okay, so it'd be interesting to see, like, okay, so if I have 
topic one. Uh, these are like just a random 15, not a random 15. These are ones that are, according to the model, definitely in topic one. And just seeing if I could, um, and I just, so these are in topic two, uh, topic three, sorry, it's gonna be three now. Um, and, and I couldn't. Ah, okay. Interesting. I I yeah, I just thought, you know, it would be interesting to see some very like emblematic representative titles. Uh, oh. and, and I still couldn't figure it out. I did see that there's a lot of repetition. So scheduling, scheduling. Uh, it looks like they had a lot of, I mean, here's career or career. So there were a lot of uh, like sub programs that were, were going on. Um, here was a career that got assigned to topic two and so on. Uh, in any case, I will leave it there uh, for this. Okay, interesting. I'll see you all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Justin, uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, and I think now we um, we will um, wait for John to, um, yeah, I mean, New Year to get started for the new book, right? Yeah, I think that's, I think that that's what uh, makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thanks, Justin, for the presentation, and uh, we see you next time. All right. I'll see you. Uh, well, I guess if I don't talk to you, uh, you know, have a good Christmas, New Year. Oh, et cetera. All right. Yeah, I think um we will compile the presentation and upload. Um, I think also if you can send me this one with your uh, script so that I can put them and upload it on your behalf to the book to the GitHub or. Okay. Yes, I will yeah. do that. All right. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much right. for that. All right. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah. bye.